right, so I gave this presentation um, once last year and once the year before, and they scheduled me first thing Saturday morning. And so I had like three people show up, and I don't know if they were hungover or uh, just, you know, kind of worn out, but I'm really excited. I said, I want to do this again. Let's do it at a different time than first thing Saturday morning because uh, I, I think that this is a fun presentation and you guys can uh, get something out of it. A um, little bit about me. I'm a senior developer and uh, I say Linux Wrangler at, uh, at Bluehost. Um, my background is both in systems and development, so it kind of gives me a unique perspective as a developer and as a systems administrator. I'm also the Open West Multimedia Committee Chair, which means I take care of all the video production. So, uh, um, so after the conference, uh, then the real work begins. We get all the video and audio from the mics and stuff. We marry them together and get them up to YouTube. By we, I mean me. So, um, and be patient with me. It's going to take a little while, especially this year. We keep adding more and more tracks. Um, I've been using Linux since about 1995 and Unix since probably the early 90s. Um, so I was exposed to a lot of the history that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and uh, I've been involved in open source communities um, since the mid-90s and open source conferences uh, since about 1999. So that's where I'm coming from. Okay. So, I want to take you guys back to the 1950s, maybe even a little earlier than that. During World War II, um, we know that computers were first developed um, as part of the war effort. And, um, and then after the war, they, people started commercializing these computers. And one of the first ones that was really commercially produced was the Univac A2. And uh, the A2 um, was developed by uh, Remington Rand and Uni Univac division. And um, they were released with the source code. So customers had access to the source code. And, uh, and thus, it's, it's believed now that the A2 was the first example of free and open source software that people could use. Um, now, this picture here is, uh, does anybody know the story of Grace Hopper? Yeah, Derek, we got a couple of people here. Grace Hopper actually worked on the Mark I, which was one of the first computers developed in the war effort by the Navy. And it was actually kind of an electro-mechanical electro computer. It had a motor that spun, and, uh, and then the, they programmed it by, by uh, having all these mechanical switches in it. But anyway, Grace Hopper went on to create the COBOL language. And... Um, I mention that because a lot of the early efforts was freely shared among the community of developers at that time. Interestingly, um, when I read about Grace Hopper, um, she was one of several big women in computer science at that time, which is, you know, she, women comprised a, a fairly big chunk of computer scientists back then. Uh, it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that there, there, there was kind of this cultural shift and now we're, I think we're trying to get back to that where women get more involved in, in development. Um, so IBM was, a, was beginning to be a big computer maker at the time as well. And the IBM users created this group called Share so they could share code, ideas, and so forth. Um, another big computer manufacturer was Digital Equipment, or DEC. Now, DEC did something interesting. Rather than the users themselves going out and creating a group, DEC created a group called DECUS, which was the Digital Equipment Corporation's User Society. And that was founded in 1961. Um, and DEC employees were encouraged to be involved, but they weren't allowed to be members. And uh, they, they uh, promoted the, uh, the open exchange of um, user-developed software uh, largely magnetic tape because, you know, they didn't have networks back then. Uh, so it was like, hey, I wrote something. Oh, give me the tape. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's fast forward to 1969. Several big things happened in 1969. There's a hint. 
Uh, one of those is man lands on the moon. Uh, the, um, the Apollo moon lander had a guidance computer, the Apollo guidance computer. Had a one megahertz clock speed. Uh, and I mention this because um, this was programmed with punch cards and in 2009 the source code for the guidance computer was released in the public domain. So you can go get that now. It's kind of interesting. Also in uh, 1969, the ARPANET is created by the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And this is, was, was the great granddaddy of the internet. What's interesting about the ARPANET is that everything about how it was designed was done through this process called RFCs. Does anybody know what RFC stands for? Request Derek? For Request for comment. Request for comment. So everything was collaborative. And that's, you know, isn't that what open source is about, is a collaboration? So we, we kind of see kind of the groundwork um, here. Uh, something else happened in 1969. Unix was created as kind of a project within Bell Labs, um, AT&T's Bell Labs. Uh, Ken Thompson was a researcher at Bell Labs. He'd been working on an operating system called Multix. Um, Multix was an ambitious operating system designed to support hundreds of simultaneous users. I know that's funny now. Hundreds of simultaneous users. Um, and it involved engineers from MIT, General Electric, and Bell Labs. After Multics had trouble supporting a mere three simultaneous users, uh, Bell Labs pulled out of the project. Uh, but uh, Thompson took many of the concepts, some of the ideas that they had worked on, and uh, implemented in them in his own operating system called Unix. And, uh, and he threw it on a, a PDP-7 a PDP that they had in the corner and, uh, and started showing it to people. And before long, you know, there was, there was this operating system called Unix. Um, something else happened in 1969. Linus Torvalds was born. We'll get back to him. Okay, let's talk about what happened in the 1970s. Any questions so far? This is all exposition. Um, so we see some progress being made in the Unix world. Unix was developed by AT&T Bell Labs. They, they saw what Ken Thompson had done and uh, they started distributing it for free to academic and government researchers. Um, in 1972, between 72 and 74, it was rewritten in C. And this is notable because once it was written in C, you could compile it for other platforms. So it was, it, you could take it, it was written originally probably in uh, assembler for the PDP-7. Now that it was in C, they could compile it for different computers. So that made it accessible on a lot of different hardware. Um, in 1975, let's see, I think I've got some notes here. Um, Okay, so uh, in 1973, Thompson, Ken Thompson gave his first public presentation about Unix, um, and people at University of California, Berkeley, noticed. And uh, Thompson returned to University of California, Berkeley, in 1975 as a visiting professor, and he got all these grad students really excited about Unix. And this, they, they created a fork of Unix that was developed at Berkeley called the Berkeley, it became known as the Berkeley System di uh, Distribution of, of, uh, of Unix. So we see kind of a fork. AT&T kind of has its own Unix. Berkeley has its own Unix. Where they, had, they had a common root, but uh, it, it diverged. So that's the 70s. I'm, I'm going over a lot of stuff here. 1980s. This is where the story gets kind of sad because the 80s kind of saw a growth of, of closed source software. Um, we know the 80s was the, you know, the big boom of the desktop computer. Um, business computing really took off. People started using computers for just about everything during the 80s and the early 90s. And people who didn't know what was going on in the industry at the time probably thought that proprietary closed source was the way it always was. But the truth is, is that, you know, open source was still going. It, it just wasn't getting all the attention, all the marketing. Um, 
We had some companies that uh, came out to commercialize Unix. Uh, Sun Microsystems, IBM came out with their version of, of Unix called AIX. HP had their HP Socks, I mean HPUX. And uh, uh, SCO uh, came out with their Xenix product and then later SCO Unix. And uh, Digital Equipment came out with their version of Unix called Ultrix. And uh, these, these were the predominant Unix operating systems in the um, in the 80s, um, and they were all closed source. They weren't giving away source code to anybody. Um, and, and of course, you know, Microsoft is releasing DOS and Windows, and they weren't giving the source code to anybody. So there was that. Um, so open source did thrive, even on those systems, even though they were closed source operating systems, they were still fertile ground for software development and for people to share stuff. Um, just because of the way Unix is designed. Uh, all, everything's a little utility and you can, and it's easy to make it work with other utilities. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a fertile ground for, for developing tools that other people can use. Um, something else that came up in the, in the 80s was the development of Usenet. Nobody uses Usenet anymore, but who used Usenet at one time? Okay, got a few hands here. Usenet, news, when I was in college in the early 90s, we would sign into news groups and read stuff. It was like a big distributed bulletin board system. Um, but Usenet kind of became a very common way to distribute ideas and code. And it became, kind of became a, a collaboration platform for uh, software projects. So another thing that was going on at the time, because the, uh, there was an internet the ARPANET had become kind of a, a, a coalition of different networks throughout the world, throughout the country. But uh, it was only available to a limited few people who were lucky enough to, to work at certain research institutions or uh, academic institutions. So a lot of code and ideas were shared across UUCP, which stands for Unix to Unix Copy Protocol, or FidoNet. Uh, FidoNet was... Uh, mostly used for copying files between <coughs> bulletin board systems. And they would, and both UUCP and FidoNet used modems, and it was kind of a store and forward system. So you would send email to someone, this is, I, I, I think this is funny because I remember using UUCP. You would send email to someone and you would assume they wouldn't get it till the next day. Because um, that's the system that, w that got your email wouldn't call out to anything else until it was like three in the morning when rates were low. So um, it wasn't like now when you send somebody email and then you call them and you say, did you get my email? No. It was different then. All right, so also during the 1980s, um, this guy, his name is uh, Richard Stallman. We'll be talking about him a lot because I've got a lot to say about Richard Stallman. Uh, Richard Stallman came up with this uh, idea. He was, he was a graduate student at MIT and uh, he came up with this idea. He was really frustrated with the fact that all the proprietary Unix systems out there put up walls to what he could do with the operating system. And he said, this is ridiculous. We have the ability as developers to create a Unix that's completely free of any kind of barriers to keep us, to do, keep us from doing what we want. And so he, he, he created a project called GNU, or GNU's not Unix. It's kind of a self-referencing acronym. And uh, yeah, it's the brainchild of Richard Stallman, um, who we all know as RMS by his initials. And he announced this on the net.unixwizards news group in September of 1983. And uh, here's the announcement. He says, starting in Thanksgiving, I'm going to write a complete Unix-compatible software system called GNU and give it away for free uh, to anyone who can use it. Um, it'll be a kernel plus all the utilities you need to write and run C programs, like an editor, shell, C compiler, linker, assembler. Um, and he goes on talking about all the things it can do. And it's kind of funny when you get down here and he says, We'll have network software based on ChaosNet, far superior to UUCP. It's not saying much, but anyway. What's interesting to think about this is that 
GNU still doesn't really exist, but this part here where he talks about all the stuff that he was going to develop to support GNU became the basis for a lot of the software we use now. He wrote Bash. He wrote GCC for compiling C programs. He wrote Emacs, which some people may argue is a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. Um, he, what this project created was the basis for a lot of other things. So we owe him our gratitude for that. Um, so this is a, another picture here of, of RMS, and this is where I tell you my Richard Stallman story. Um, in uh, 1999, I was a student at Utah State, and uh, we had a free software and Linux club on campus. And we decided we were going to have our first conference. And for our first conference, we had invited Richard Stallman to come and speak. And I volunteered, along with a friend of mine, to go down to the Salt Lake Airport and pick up Richard Stallman and drive him up to Logan for the conference. Now, a lot of people who do the kind of things that we do have social quirks, kind of, you know, interesting personality traits, and, and, and Richard is, uh, is no exception from that. I mean, maybe you could say he's on the extreme in that. So, so bear with me. Uh, my, my friend Chad went with me, and uh, I have a story here that, that he wrote. He's a writer, so that's why it's so good. So bear with me while I read you this story that Chad wrote about us driving down and picking up Richard Stallman, RMS, from the airport. He says, Concerning the RMS run, I've forgotten a lot about that night on purpose. I'll tell you what I remember. It probably contains hyperbole and inaccuracies. No, I take that back. Not probably, certainly. What I remember best is that RMS was unpleasant, supercilious, judgmental, and worst of all, oblivious to his own behavior. Basically, he was a jackass. At the time, Dorn and I were excited about free so the sub free software movement. I was under the impression that RMS was sort of the Yoda of free software, so I was eager to make a good impression. I tried to be as friendly and charming as I could be. Dorn was doing the same. We helped RMS carry his baggage. We opened doors for him. We made everything as easy as possible. But all these efforts were utterly wasted. RMS regarded us the same way as he regarded Doran's car. We were merely background utilities necessary for conveying the priceless treasure of his intellect from place to place. He was a textbook messiah. If we genuflected at his feet and kissed the hem of his raiment, he would not have even flinched. RMS moved about cautiously as though he knew he was very fragile and that something close by could injure him. He could not do anything swiftly. He walked, sat on, and spoke only after a slow fury of sighing, eye-blinking, and hand-waving. His beard was thin and wispy, and his skin was pallid like he'd never been exposed to sunshine, ever. But his fingernails were long and yellow. He never made eye contact, now that I remember. Instead, he gazed into the middle distance with a heavy-lidded, semi-dazed expression, as though he was receiving continuous revelation from God. RMS did not speak. RMS intoned. He orated in a prophetic, messianic way. This worked okay when he said things like, the problem with selling things is that you have to ask for money. But it was less impressive when he said things like, I urgently need to go to the bathroom, or I like Skittles. He reminded me of a softer, paler, shorter version of Jesus Christ. At the airport, Dorn and I placed RMS in Dorn's car and gingerly arranged him so that it, he seemed satisfied that nothing in the vehicle would puncture or otherwise disturb him, and we started on our way to Logan. Dorn and I tried to be sociable with RMS. We're pretty versed in a variety of conversation topics, relevant and obscure, and we're quick to laugh. No one could have asked for more pleasant company on a 90-minute ride. But again, we were practically beneath his notice. He tolerated us as one might suffer a dog licking himself in the corner of the room. And so the conversation in the car was largely between Dorn and I. Yes, he lectured Dorn for using a credit card. I can't even remember the reason, privacy or something. The funny thing is, he also claimed he didn't have any cash with him, 
So I paid for him to get a bottle of water to drink, whereupon he lectured me on the evils of bottled water. <laughs> and he never paid me back. Richard Stallman still owes me a dollar and 80 cents. <laughs> when we bought, okay, here we go. When we got back to the car, RMS produced a cassette tape and ordered Doran to play it, by which I mean he handed it to Doran and said, play this. Even I had started using CDs and MP3s by this point, but the digital Yoda pulls out a cassette tape that appears to have been around since the advent of magnet magnetic tape. It was Ukrainian folk music, which sounded like a cat fight, set to music, and then played at two times the normal speed. Both sides of the tape were just one unceasing song, but there were certain passages of it that RMS found quite moving. You knew when he was getting into his jam because he tilted his head back and waved his hands dreamily. He had no compunction over cutting someone off mid-sentence to draw attention to ghastly strains of music. However, he wouldn't be caught dead doing anything as primeval and mindless as working the knobs on an automobile stereo. That's where the troglodyte humanoids all around him were for. So he gestured at the stereo and insists that Doran make this louder or increase the volume. He also killed the conversation by making these finalistic, irrefutable statements. So Doran might be in the middle of a claim about server networking speeds when RMS would suddenly silence him with a statement about how copyrights were contributing to the problem of noise pollution. I mentioned the term open source, and he'd say, no, free software. Then I'd say free software, and he'd say, you mean open source. Every, every day exchange ended with, every exchange ended with RMS correcting our opinions or word choice. From time to time, RMS did ask questions especially when he observed things that he did not approve of, and, and, he, and he approved of almost nothing. There were aspects of the Salt Lake Airport that he wasn't too happy about, for example. I don't remember what exactly, but he seemed to think that Dorn and I were available to forward all of his complaints about everything directly to the city of Salt Lake. At one point, we drove past a huge cra uh, gravel quarry on the side of the mountain on the north side of Salt Lake City. This was late at night, and there was a swarm of earth-moving equipment working in the pit under the harsh glare of sodium arc lighting. RMS apparently found this offensive for some reason, because he raised his plump and silky hands to make an annoyed, perplexed gesture in that direction and said, what is this? What is happening there? I said, they're doing a huge overhaul of the interstate right now. They're working on it around the clock. Why is that? RMS asked. I don't know, I said. I guess no one told them they could move the clock. I thought that was pretty clever. I think Doran chuckled. RMS thought about it for a few seconds. Then he smiled, nodded his head, and said, ha ha. <laughs> this is not to say he laughed. He said the word ha two times. <laughs> it's not like he, he was actually a human, but had been briefed on how to react to the primitive custom of humor. It killed, he killed most of our attempts of humor that way. Ah, I see, he'd say. Double meaning of the word boob. Quite amusing. The funny thing is, RMS himself tried to uh, uh, make a few attempted wisecracks, but the punchlines were so abstract and insular, we had no idea what he was talking about, so we too had to respond with mechanical smiles and hollow laughter. After a while, the stereo volume and the heater were running at more or less maximum output, and we drove along without speaking while RMS swayed woozily to his folk music. We reached Logan and went to the apartment of this kid named Ray, whose great honor it was to have RMS lodge with him. Ray was even more worshipful of RMS than Dorn and I had been. RMS was Ray's hero, I guess. So when we pulled up, Ray was waiting out on the front lawn. It was the middle of the night by then, and Ray was literally jumping up and down with excitement. Of course, RMS greeted Ray in the same way he might greet a mailbox or a shrub, which is to say he briefly looked in Ray's direction. He may have nodded, but that was it. Then RMS intoned to no one specifically, I require a room with a door, a pan for water, and one vacuum cleaner with a long hose and then he walked off in the direction of Ray's apartment. At the time, the request struck me as hilarious because I was trying unsuccessfully to picture the rest of his evening. Like maybe he vacuumed himself off every night instead of showering. Could it be some kind of hydraulic religious observance? Turns, our, turns out RMS always traveled with an air mattress that he could inflate with a vacuum cleaner. And while he did not necessarily bathe, he enjoyed rinsing his beard. I'm sure both of these enhanced his privacy in some way. I can't say for certain. Ray must have detected that Dorn and I were anxious to just get away from RMS because he shrugged questioningly to, to ask us what the matter was. We only rolled our eyes and waved him off as to say, he's your problem now, and then we got the hell out of there. <laughs>
The next time I saw Ray, he looked so defeated that I might have otherwise guessed he'd been repeatedly sodomized. But I knew what had actually happened. I had only spent a couple of hours being questioned, corrected, and lectured at by RMS. Ray got that treatment for a couple of days. And that's just about how everyone on campus who came in contact with RMS acted too. Everyone just wanted him to go home and never come back. I did not even bother to go to the presentation he was invited to give. I, I, I heard, later heard that he was likewise abusive to his hosts, berated them for, what, for the way that he, they promoted the event, and left the same dirty tastes in their mouths. So there you go, RMS. And he's a great guy. We love him for what he, what he did for the community. He's just odd and kind of difficult. Um, Yes. I, I was there at that event at USU. There, there was a scene where he blew up. At the oh, yes. Because, because one of the, uh, I can't remember what company it was, they sent a box of books to give away. Yeah. And he was just perturbed that we were giving away copyrighted material. Get that out of here. <laughs> Here's some video from the airport. <laughs> it did happen. I'm not making this up. Here's video from the... What he's saying isn't really that important. <laughs> this is from Linux World 1999. He was invited to some panel, came up without his shoes on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that concludes our RMS. Any questions about RMS? Important figure in the history of open source. I just wanted to point that out. And thank you for indulging me on that story. I love this story. I'm, I'm glad that Chad wrote it up as well as he did. Um, some other free software during the 80s, Tex. Does anybody use Tex? Tex is the creation of Donald Knuth. It's a, uh, uh, basically a text layout system. It's very, very cool. Uh, Spice was developed for the use of um, you know, electrical engineers for developing circuits and stuff like that. And then the X window system was a windowing system for Unix. Um, and those were pretty cool things. They're, the X window system is, we're still using it today. So uh, it's uh, <coughs> survived a good long time. In 1991, Linux is born. August 26th, Linus Torvalds, he was a, a computer science student in Finland, um, codes up a simple Unix-like kernel for the 16-bit, uh, uh, like a 386-type uh, architecture, and announces it in the Comp OS Minix newsgroup. <coughs> Uh, in 1992, he finally releases it under the, uh, uh, the GPL. So here's the announcement that he posted to the news group. And some of this stuff is kind of funny when you read it now. Um, he says he's ported Bash. Remember, Bash is what Richard Stallman wrote. And GCC, same thing. Um, and... He says he, he, he's not look. He, he doesn't think it'll be anything big. Um, it's free. He doesn't have big plans for it. He's just having fun. Just a hobby. It won't be big. Yeah, it won't be big. So, just a hobby. So let's talk about some of the early Linux history. <coughs> Version 0 0.01, October 9, 1991. Um, 63K compressed. I'm just going to zip through here. We can kind of see what happens. Uh, by the time version 1.0 comes out in March 1994, it's gotten quite a bit bigger. This is due to contributions from people all over the internet. Um, and uh, one thing that was interesting is that Linux didn't have support for TCP IP networking until right around in here version 0 0.98. Uh, even then, it was really crude. Um, and and I, I remember the early versions of Linux, you didn't do, you didn't download it. You would, uh, well, you would download it, but to get it on the system, 
you had to do this thing with floppy disks. Um, and that's how you got software onto it because you couldn't just like FTP and stuff like that. Uh, but by the time 94 came around, they, they finally had some TCP IP networking. Um, and that was due to, uh, um, there was actually a feud going on within the early Linux community between uh, an engineer named Alan Cox and another guy named Fred Van Kimpen. And uh, a lot of people believe that, that Van Kimpen's code was over-engineered, so Fred Cox kind of stepped in and simplified it just to get networking up and running. And uh, that's, that's what early networking was, was just like, let's just get this working. Um, Linus's role in sorting things out is interesting because um, he, he was becoming the leader of an open source project at this point. Um, and the whole time that this was going on, remember he posted this to the Minix news group, which Minix was a, was a, a kind of an academic uh, version of Unix for the 386. And so he posted this to the Minix news group, and a lot of people in the Minix communi community thought it was really cool. But the creator of Minix, um, uh, his name was Tannenbaum, was not pleased <laughs> at all um, that uh, Linux was being created or that it was, that it was even being compared to Minix at all. And uh, he repeatedly made statements uh, in Usenet and publicly that Linux was doomed. Um, pretty soon, people started taking the Linux kernel and throwing in other open source code with it, and that became Linux distributions. And some of the early distributions was uh, SLS. Um, I can't pronounce that one. And Slackware. <laughs> uh, and then around about 94, uh, Debian and Red Hat kind of came out about the same time. And Caldera was uh, kind of like a spin of Red Hat. Caldera was right here in Utah Valley. So there's Linus Torvalds. I want to say that's about 1999, 1998 with a, with a, a Sony laptop running Linux. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference of philosophy between uh, RMS and Linus, just a little bit. RMS is um, very demanding. If you're going to even be in the same room with them, you got to say things the right way. You got to use the right software. Linus is like, you know, I'll do what I want and you do what you want. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but he does have his opinions. This is uh, his response to uh, something that NVIDIA did with, the, with drivers for the Linux kernel. Um, so moving on, a little bit more history here. Uh, in 1993, a lawsuit between uh, Unix System Labs, which was managing the Unix that came out of AT&T, and BSDI, which was handling the Unix that uh, came out of Berkeley, was settled. And uh, at that point, now the Berkeley distribution could be uh, forked and open sourced and whatnot. And so we had these other um, Berkeley 
uh, variants that came out of that. You can, they're open source, you can use them now, you can do whatever you want with them. They're pretty cool. Uh, for a long time, the BSDs actually had a really solid uh, networking stack compared to Linux. Uh, it, was, it was a few years before Linux caught up, and I, I'm sure if I said something about one of them being more superior to the other, I'd have somebody start an argument with me, so I'm not going to say anything about it. But they're both really good at this point. Let's talk about some of the important server software that's come out of open source. Um, Apache, Perl, I say that because I use Perl every day. Uh, PHP, which I almost didn't put on here, but that's just because of my opinions. Uh, SendMail, Bind is a, kind of the, the big gorilla among uh, domain name service services, and uh, OpenSSH. Let's talk about Apache. In the early days of the World Wide Web, so we're talking about the uh, early to mid 2000, uh, 1990s, um, NCSA had an HTTP daemon that was the predominant web server in the early days of the web. There was one problem, though. There was this <laughs> company called Netscape that was hiring all the engineers away from, from NCSA. And, uh, and so the HTTP daemon was starting to stagnate. Uh, so Brian uh, Bellendorf, who um, was working for Hotwired at the time, Hotwired was kind of like the online version of Wired Magazine. This is like back in... 95 or so. Yeah, early 95. Uh, so he formed the Apache pro uh, project using an, an older version of the, the NCSA uh, code as the basis. And, uh, and that's how Apache was born. Uh, SendMail was actually developed uh, at Berkeley as part of the, uh, the BSD Unix. And it kind of became the, uh, the de facto mail system for the ARPANET and its, um, and its progeny. Uh, DARPA standardized on, on BSD Unix and shipped, it, shipped SendMail with, with all the, the systems that were connected to the, the early internet. And uh, SendMail's uh, incredibly versatile configuration was usable on a wide variety of, of scenarios. I kind of became a SendMail guru in the early 90s. Um, SendMail, you could use it to send email over UUCP. And that code is still there, even though nobody uses it. But it was fun, fun to get into. The, they, at the time, uh, I want to say about 95, uh, the SendMail bat book, the O'Reilly book on SendMail, they had a bat on the cover, was the biggest one that they sold. It was, it was like over 1,000 pages. It wasn't until the Python book came out that they had anything that even rivaled it. So SendMail was cool, but it, was, it, it took a lot to, to do what you needed to do. But you could do anything with SendMail. Uh, Bind, the Berkeley Internet Name Daemon. Uh, like SendMail, it was included in distributions. And because it was the de facto DNS server for anything connecting to the early internet, uh, a lot of people got to know about Bind. And it's still in use today. Uh, OpenSSH, interesting history here. Um, who was using the internet? say, prior to um, 1995. In here, anybody? A no, couple people using the internet. So back then, we didn't have anything like SSH. We would use things like Telnet if we wanted to log into a computer. And we'd use things like FTP, which for some unknown reason people still use today. Um, and we'd use things like RCP or R login, which any secure, anybody who's remotely aware of security would just like vomit if, if you try to use that today. These were horrendously insecure um, protocols and programs, but I think it reflects the type of atmosphere that kind of existed on the internet um, prior to the early to mid 90s, and it was mostly academic institutions and everybody trusted everybody. Um, I mean, you know, if you got in trouble, they would just, you know, take away your user account and you wouldn't be able to get on the network anymore. But um, X Mission, they're downstairs. They're the, one of the sponsors of the room. Uh, they set up shop in October of 1993 as the first internet service provider here in Utah. And that's just an example of what was happening in the early 90s. There were commercial interests coming on, online. The internet was, was not just academic institutions anymore. And suddenly there was risk uh, on, on this network. And I remember I was in school at the time. Uh, somebody pointed out that if you, uh, if you went into a computer lab and you ran a certain kind of software on your computer, uh, 
because everything was plugged into hubs, not switches, you could see people's usernames and passwords going over the wire in clear text. There was nothing stopping you from doing that. Now, obviously, if you, you know, once you move from hubs to switches, that stops that, but there's still this, the fact that stuff was going over the wire in clear text. So uh, that's just what I just said. Uh, so as the internet opened up, we had these vulnerabilities of these, of these protocols. And um, in 1995, uh, this guy, Tatu Yolanin, uh, released SSH and, and created a company to, uh, to sell SSH as a, as a service and, um, and software associated with it. And SSH encrypted console logins, replacing Telnet and, and our login. It encrypted file transfer, replacing RCP and FTP. And you could do all kinds of cool stuff with it, like sending other traffic over your SSH session uh, via port forwarding. So very cool stuff. But there's more to this story. Um, SSH was not open source. Uh, it had some limitations. SSH2 was released. SSH2 came with a new license that was more restrictive. And the code, you, you couldn't contribute back, that sort of thing. So OpenSSH was created by the, uh, some folks in the, Open S, uh, the OpenBSD project where they took a fork of the, some of the older SSH code and implemented, um, eventually implemented SSH version 1 and version 2. So the term open source did not exist until about 1998 or so. Prior to that, nobody really knew what to call this stuff, this Linux and Apache and things like that. You know, Richard Stallman was going around telling everybody, you got to call it free software. And of course, everybody in America just thought, cool, we don't have to pay for it. He said, no, no, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. I mean, free is in liberty. Free is in speech. <clears throat> and you're thinking free is in beer. It's not that. So <clears throat> some stories, the, the, op the term open source comes from a couple of different um, points here. In 1996, a uh, guy who wrote the Fetch Mail program, his name was Eric Raymond, publishes an essay online called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And his essay is, is a persuasive essay saying that once you share the code, your software is better because many eyeballs tame complexity. Once you get the code out there and you have other people contributing, even the most complex software becomes more manageable. In 1998, um, <clears throat> Netscape throws in the towel because if you guys remember 1997-98 there was this big battle going on between Microsoft and Netscape. Microsoft was was trying to win the mantle for the the, the most used web browser in the world. Netscape um, <clears throat> is kind of losing this battle because they don't have an operating system to fight with. And uh, some executives at Netscape read Eric Raymond's essay and decide we know what we need to do to stay alive in this fight. We need to go open source. We need to just give our code to the community and, and, uh, and, and collaborate with people online. And so Netscape goes away as a, as a product, and this new project called the Mozilla Project is born. <coughs> open source as a term was born because people didn't like Stallman's free software. And the open source initiative um, was created in 1998 by Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrins. Uh, Bruce Perrins was one of the guys who created the Debian project, and he's also a big, big name in the open source uh, world. Um, in fact, he was our second or third person, the second or third person we brought to USU to speak after Richard Stallman the next year or something like that. We, we, we invited Bruce Perrins to come out, and he was much nicer. <laughs> <coughs> Um, let me whip through this one real fast. Uh, Star Office. You guys remember Star Office? Star Office was what Open Office became and LibreOffice now. So Star Office was developed by a German company called Star Division. They were acquired by Sun Microsystems in 1999. The cool, cool thing about Star Office was this was an office suite <clears throat> that could read and write Microsoft Office formats. And it not only ran on Windows, but it also ran on Linux and other Unix um, operating systems. Sun took the Star Office source code and announces that they're, in 2000, they're going to release it as a new product called OpenOffice. 
Um, but the story doesn't end there. In 2010, uh, there's some project management friction going on within the uh, open office community. And um, there's a fork in Libra offices born. And, uh, and I'm using it right now. It's great. It's just another example of how open source um, is cool and thrives. Um, that kind of concludes the history portion of this presentation. But I wanted to point out some things. There, there are some really good books out there for people who are interested in this stuff. The one that I found the most interesting is it's not very, I, I, don't, I haven't met anybody else who's read it, but it's, a, it's called Rebel Code, and it was written right around 2000 or so. And it's about the history of Linux and some of the other open source projects that, that surround it. And it's by a guy named Glenn Moody. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, Linus Torvalds has written a book, or had collaborated on a book called Just for Fun. Um, Stephen Levy has, has a, uh, written quite a bit, actually, about hackers in general, whether they be hackers, people that hack code, or hackers that break into your systems, uh, or crackers, as they're sometimes called. But he's written a lot of stuff. This, this, is actually, this book is actually about um, people who just want to figure things out and, uh, and they tinker. He talks about the MIT lab in the, in the 60s and 70s and so forth. Um, really interesting contributions to open source there. And then I mentioned before Grace Hopper. That's a really cool, um, really cool story. She's a, a much, uh, I think, an underappreciated person in the history of computer science. And, uh, and then Katie Havner, who is Stephen Levy's wife, uh, wrote uh, Where Wizards Stay Up Late, which is the history of the ARPANET. Really good book. Any questions? Any comments? Any like uh, personal stories that you want to share <laughs> from your own experiences of history? Yeah? No, but I have a question. You said Phoenix came about in 1969. I just wondered what they did for time, because doesn't Unix time start? That's a good question. I, well, actually, I, I have a feeling that the uh, epic time didn't actually get implemented until uh, Unix was rewritten in C, when they actually had they they standardized on a 32-bit integer register, and so prior to that, they they were using whatever the PDP-7 had. Does that seemed like a reasonable assumption. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they what they used for uh, for time back then, but I, that seems reasonable. Any other stories, questions, observations? Yeah. Just, well, you got the book list up there. One other book that's worthwhile is called Open Sources. Open Sources. Voices from the uh, let's see, hang on, I got it up here. Voices from the Open Source Revolution. It's an O'Reilly book, but it's basically just an anthology of little essays. Uh, one's written by Linus, one's written by RMS, one's written by Ericus Raymond, one's written by... Gerard I'm surprised Reynolds. that Richard Stallman allowed his essay to be published in a book titled Open Sources. He did it on one condition. <laughs> he did it on the condition that his chapter be made available for free on the O'Reilly website. Oh, okay. Which they comply with. <laughs> did you have another? Okay. You're just doing this? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? That's, that's, that's good. Open Sources... Uh, I, I wanted to also mention there's a video. And it's, you can watch it online now for free on YouTube. It's called Revolution OS. Uh, it was made right around the, you know 2000 or so. Um, and the reason 2000 was kind of a big deal, 99 to 2001, was because that was kind of the uh, uh, the sweet 16 for Linux. When it, you know, I remember I went to Linux World in 1999 in. I want to say uh, August. It was in San Jose, and it was just a big party for uh, open source hackers and stuff like that. And that was the well, Linus coming out and giving the speech at the conference. That was that was in the fall, summer, fall of of '99. In uh, <clears throat> 2000, in the winter of 2000, they had another Linux World, and this was at the Javits Center in uh, New York. And the tone of the conference had just changed dramatically in those few short months. Now at least half of the people were Wall Street types, and they were coming to find out what the heck is this Linux stuff, and, and who can we give money to. Um, 
I, it's, it's really fun watching the video that I took at that conference because you see all these companies that have, have been gone. They, I mean, they only lasted for a year or two because uh, they were just burning through uh, seed money, that, and, but they didn't really have any real business plan or anything like that. But uh, uh, there was a company called Linux Care. Uh, Caldera is gone now. Um, lots of different distributions that are no longer around because they couldn't quite figure out how to make money doing open source. Um, so anyway, uh, Revolution OS, and, um, and yeah, that was, that was made right around that time. And they have interviews in Revolution OS with a lot of the same people that I've talked about here. Anything else? I hope this was fun and informative. Thank you. <laughs>